Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to a, another Sunday morning version of Jesus and Jeans. We're glad to have you all here this morning. Oh, boy. Beautiful day in the neighborhood. We're hoping the rain's going to hold off just a little bit. we got folks outside today, so thank you all. Hey, hey. Hey. Glad to see everybody. Awesome. <laughs> well, welcome to Jesus and Jeans. My name is Teddy Baker, along with my wife Jan, Jim and Sandra Pinner, Bobby and Dawn Privet, Chuck and Karen Watkins. Glad to have them back today. We want to welcome all of you here to Jesus and Jeans. It's uh, worship at the cottage, and we're glad to, to have you, especially if you're joining us via the internet. We're always honored that you take time wherever you are in the world, literally, to, uh, to worship with us, and we thank you so much. We're going to do uh, a couple of familiar worship songs here this morning. These are just two of my favorites, kind of my go-to songs sometimes. And uh, I just felt like uh, like the Lord was speaking to me this day to, uh, to come and to worship him this day. And uh, what a special day. Anytime we gather in the name of Christ, it's a special day. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Y'all ready to praise the Lord? Oh, yeah. All righty. Just as you are before your God, come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who glad to choose you. No. 
So, folks, we uh, want to pray for this morning. First of all, we want to wish our good friend, uh, Sherry's not here today, but today's her birthday. And uh, Sherry Connor, uh, just a great friend. She and Tommy Joe have been uh, friends of mine. Or Tommy's been a friend of mine since both of us had dark hair. <laughs> but that's been a long time. <laughs> but uh, Sherry's birthday today, so we want to celebrate that with her today. We want to pray for Jane Ballard. She's got a, going back to North Carolina to be with her sister. Uh, he's having uh, hip surgery, right, in uh, replacement in uh, about a week or so. So traveling mercies for Jane and uh, uh, just all the, the ministry gifts to take care of your sister. Uh, I want to pray for uh, uh, a gentleman, uh, our, our neighbors, Tony and Shelly uh, Van Beers. Uh, Tony's brother, Klaus, uh, had a, a heart uh, transplant yet uh, this weekend. It's doing pretty well. Got some kind of normal swelling, but uh, they still have his chest open until tomorrow. And so uh, I want to pray for Klaus and uh, for Tony and Shelly and their family. Uh, Shelly just lost her mom. They were out in uh, Montana, or out in that area, um, for um, her mom's uh, celebration of life. And so just they've been uh, under a lot. So just keep Tony and Shelly in your prayers and certainly Tony's brother, Klaus. Uh, come, Jan, uh, con continue to remember Jan. Jan's getting a little bit better. Infection is cleared up. We're, thank God for that. And uh, she's still just not able to put a lot of weight on the foot. It's taking just a little bit longer than what uh, we originally had planned. But, <laughs> gosh, yes, the plans of mice and men. I mean, I want to continue to pray for uh, Tanya, Bonnie and Howard's uh, daughter, just ongoing health issues. Kurt and Laura Mather, just thank God. Uh, you know, I, I think about Kurt uh, just a couple weeks ago, turned 83, right? and uh, just uh, and, and is continuing to, to kick cancer in the, in the rear end. And so I, I just I love that. Uh, I want to continue to pray for Donna Dulac and Kay Wiley and the loss of uh, her husband and, uh, and son. Uh, and uh, Kay's lost her, her husband. Uh, our good friend Sue South, uh, Susan South, uh, just ongoing uh, health issues there. Um, John Beline's niece and nephew, Juanita and Marklin. Uh, Tori, still waiting on a, a liver transplant. Uh, Maria Barbado, uh, Vertigo. Uh, Pam Bryant, uh, loss of hearing. Uh, Mike Edmondson, Wayne Reed's uh, former business partner. Uh, continued prayers for him. Uh, and also Wayne's cousin, Johnny Bow. Uh, Colleen Bradley, her brother-in-law, Don Johnson, uh, the, had been um, uh, called in hospice with his uh, situation. Uh, Colleen's friend, uh, Christina, who lost her house in a fire. 
uh, Ken Baxley uh, dealing with uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, Cheryl Lusnia, his ongoing uh, health issues with her, her blood pressure, uh, Steve and Kathy uh, Schmidt, just unspoken prayers. Um, and then uh, Joe, you're, uh, Joe is back in the hospital. She's back in the hospital. She's got the fluid now in her lungs. So fluid in the lungs and um, was doing great and then now back in the hospital with the fluid in the lungs. Uh, Jim's nephew, Klaus, uh, still dealing with the pancreatic lung and, and the liver cancer. Uh, Gary Knotts, um, dealing with also cancer. Joy Pruitt, uh, still dealing with the pancreatic cancer and, and cancer in the lung. Uh, John Ballard, uh, uh, let's see, Bryce uh, Mosseri, um, he's a four-year-old with brain cancer that we've been praying for. And then Adriana Lee, Crystal and Mike's uh, friend, has lung and spine cancer. And then uh, Colleen's friend, Carol, also has, uh, has a brain, uh, I think, surgery or brain tumor. So I want to continue to pray for them. And, and then, uh, how's your niece doing, Dave? Yeah, I'm going to give you an update. She is doing wonderful. Uh, praise God. Uh, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing my sister, her mama, today. <coughs> my big sister. Amen. And I'm seeing my uh, brother. And all the well, certainly let them know we're praying for her. And, uh, amen. Yeah, That's it. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Let's pray together. My Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. This is the day that you have made, and we rejoice and are glad in it. Father, we never take for granted all of your handiwork and all of your ability to go before us. Father, we, we just praise you today for who you are. You are our King. You are our God, our Creator, our Lord, our Savior. And so, Father, help us to always keep that in the forefront of our thinking, our, our, our emotions, uh, everything that we go through in this world, God, the, the sickness, the, the health issues that we, we all face, Father. We, we just pray, God, that we'll continually be able to come to you and to hand those things over to you knowing father that you go before us in every situation and every trial that we face there's nothing that escapes your view and so father we we just thank you that you are the kind of god that we can come to as your children that we can crawl up into your lap and say abba thank you we pray for your blessings today. As we gather together to worship you, we pray, Father, your blessings on our message and our time together. As I always do every Sunday, Holy Spirit, come. Fill our hearts and our lives. Literally change us from the inside out. That we might be better prepared to engage the world around us that they might be able to see Jesus in us we love you Lord we thank you for every single day that you give us we thank you for every blessing that you send our way but most of all we thank you for your grace we pray your blessings in the most powerful name that of your son Jesus and all God's children said Amen. 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 Well, this morning we continue in our, our series uh, of the, on the parables of Jesus. And our, our parable today is one that's been a, a spiritual marker in my life for almost 35 years. It's called the parable of the wheat and the tares. And it's found in Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to be looking at verses 24 through 30. And so as you turn there, I wanted to share uh, with you some of my testimony. You see, years ago, God used this parable through a uh, hellfire and brimstone evangelist by the name of Bailey Smith. And he helped to, me to see something in my life that would be a game changer for me as a Christ follower. God showed me through this parable that at that time, my spiritual journey was more about just going through the motions. It was, it, it was more about, you know, in other words, I looked the part of being 
a Christian. I was doing all the right things. I was saying all the right words, saying all the right phrases. I, I Literally, I had gone through a major transition from who I used to be to who I thought I was then. I went to church every time the doors were open, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night. I even went to Wednesday night services. I served in various ministries in the church. I even sang in the choir. And so when this evangelist, Bailey Smith, came uh, the first Sunday to preach for our annual revival, our, our choir received word from his music director that Reverend Smith had decided to change his message. And so we had to change some of the songs that, that we had planned to sing. And so as we entered the sanctuary and we got settled, Bailey Smith walks up to the pulpit and he says, Good morning, I've decided to change my message this morning because I believe that there's someone here today that needs to hear this word from the Lord. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 13, 24 through 30. Well, unbeknownst to him or anybody else in the church, I had been studying this chapter every day at my job. I had a little bitty, you remember the little Gideon Bibles I used to find all the time? I had a little orange one that I kept in my toolbox all the time. And every day I would open it up to read it when I would take a break. And for whatever reason, this little Gideon Bible would always open up to Matthew chapter 13. And so I, I, I prayed oftentimes asking the Lord to, to show me what he wanted me to learn from this chapter. Well, that Sunday morning as I sat in the choir and I listened to this message, I found out what God was trying to communicate to me. <clears throat> Bailey Smith talked about the wheat and the tares and how they grow together. And the difference between the two is that they both look so much alike. But when you break the wheat open, you actually find wheat. But when you break the tear open, it's empty. There's nothing there. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart that morning that I had been going through the motions, that I looked like a believer. I acted like a believer. But I really had not settled the issue of accepting Christ into my heart and into my life. And so that morning when the invitation was given, I was the first one who said, I will not go, not another minute, without settling this in my heart. And as they say, the rest is history. It began a journey in ministry for me that I never, ever expected, never knew would even happen. And so today, I want us to look together at this, this parable. And I'm going to read today from the New Living Translation. And so if you guys will hang in there with me, let me, uh, let me read these scriptures to you. And it says this in verse 24. It says, here is another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked. No, he replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, to tie them in, into bundles and burn them, and to put the wheat in the barn. 
very powerful story. But I'm going to give it a little different twist than what I received from Bailey Smith. I've, I've seen Bailey Smith even have pastors question their salvation because of the way that he used the word as a, a club more than a, rather than a bridge. Last week I told you that by definition a parable is a simple story using concrete word imagery to make a single point. In Jesus' case, Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God and what it was like. So what's the point of the parable? It's simply this. The kingdom of God is a mixed bag in which wheat and weeds grow together. Side by side. And you can't always tell them apart. There are three things that I want you to know about this parable. Number one, in Jesus' day, sowing weeds in a neighbor's field was a, a common way folks had of getting even with each other. Instead of, you know, spray painting graffiti on the wall of the house or egging the neighbor's chariot, they'd sow Johnson grass in the neighbor's wheat or in their corn or in their barley. It had become such a common practice that the Roman government actually passed a law against it. Number two, this particular seed spoken of in the parable of the wheat and the tares is called bearded darnel. It was a variety of ryegrass, and in its early stages of growth, it was indistinguishable from wheat. You couldn't tell them apart. You didn't know that darnel was growing in your field until the, start, the stalks started to produce. And by then, it was too late because the roots would be so interwoven that to pull up the weeds would be to pull up the wheat. And then number three, the seeds of the bearded darnel, were, they were poisonous. They would make you sick. The name comes from the French word darna which means stupefied. The symptoms of eating Darnell grain were dizziness, slurred speech, vomiting, and diarrhea. It, it, this stuff was bad stuff. And so putting all of these things together, Jesus told this parable. And so it, it made me ask again, how do you think this parable applies to us today? Well, there, there are three lessons that, that I got gleaned from this scripture as I read it again that I believe are very important for us as Christ followers, not as Christians. Or Christian is a word that is, by definition, very vague. But if you call yourself a Christ follower, then the stakes are raised. It moves you up a little bit. Your commitment has changed. You're just not part of a group. You are actually the following the one you say you profess. And so what are the lessons that we need to learn? The first lesson speaks to one of the most prevalent, I believe, of all of our struggles, all of our sins. And it's the sin of judging other people. In other words, playing God and deciding for ourselves who's worthy and who's not. You're in, you're out. Jesus recognized this tendency in his followers early on. That's why he, he, he reminds us in Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 and 2. He says, don't judge so that you won't be judged. For what, with whatever judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with whatever measure you measure, it will be measured to you. You see, in the church, and I've been doing this for a long time, but in the church, we know better than to stand in judgment of others. Yet we do it anyway. 
particularly when it comes to the fitting in with the overall congregation. Over the years, there, there's an attitude that I've observed, something deep down inside of certain personality types within the church that desires to separate the sheep from the goats and the saints from the sinners and the good guys from the bad guys. And so unconscious, unconsciously, I, I think what happens is that they set themselves up as gatekeepers, as the spiritual police, so to speak. They practice selective evangelism. They defer to those whom they want to be part of their fellowship while they politely discourage the others. And as the church, we all have our own little litmus test that we use, but they're pretty much the same. And what I've observed is that it's, it's based mostly on how others act, how they dress, how they talk, where they live, what they do for a living. And the common denominator is that we are attracted to those who are like us. That's why birds of a feather do what? Flock together. This is really nothing new. We, we've known it for a long time, and the problem is, is that this attitude gets translated into what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ. And without really trying, we become this homogenous congregation, all looking and acting pretty much alike. <laughs> and by acting that way, it, it gives us a certain comfort. It gives us consensus. Then when someone who's different from us joins our fellowship, we become skeptic and concerned. And what are those people all about? And where did you come from? <laughs> we become concerned and restless until eventually, finally, we just weed them out. I've seen it happen over and over and over. People excited about accepting Christ, they come in, sit on the front row. But by the time people get through wearing them out, they end up on the back row and then eventually out the door. You see, that scenario is exactly what started the idea of Jesus and jeans. I remember Jim and Sandra telling Jan and I about visiting some of the churches in the area when they first moved here. They were trying to, their best to, to join a church where they felt comfortable and could possibly help and serve in the various ministries that the church offered. Well, everything was fine until these churches found out that they owned a winery. Suddenly, each one turned them down and told them, you know, it would probably be better if you just went somewhere else and found another church to attend. They were no longer welcome. And to be honest, I wasn't the least bit surprised that that happened. I'd seen it happen over and over and over again throughout my years in ministry. You see, back in the early days, of our country, the, the Puritans. You remember the Puritans? Well, that was a happy group. <laughs> Couldn't wait to do lunch with one of those guys. You know. the, the Puritans in the early days of our country, the, they, they made a concerted effort to purge the church of all of those who, in their estimation, were not of pure faith. Well, they failed at their attempt, and I, for one, am glad they did. Because here's the key, gang. If there's no place in the church for people who are wanting, searching, needing, desperately trying to find something different to be accepted and loved, then there's no real place for you and me. In his book, Going Home, author Robert Raines 
describes what he pictures to be the church of Jesus Christ. And he says it this way. He says, it is not a neat, tidy, sober congregation seated side by side in back-to-back -back pews facing forward. But rather a milling crowd, pushing, shoving, loving, laughing. It's a Moses mob in the wilderness on its way to the promised land. It's not the righteous, but the sinners whom Jesus came to call. In another one of his teachings, Jesus said, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some fish of every kind. See, that's my heart for Jesus and James. I don't care who you are. Don't care where you come from. Don't, want you, don't care what you have or have not. Come. Because now is the time to worship. So that's the first lesson that we need to learn. That the parable of, of the wheat and tares, the kingdom of God is a mixed bag. In which it's not always clear which one is the wheat and which one is the tare. Which is the wheat, which is the weed. And as such, we would do well, I believe, as the body of Christ, not to try to judge one from the other. The second lesson that we need to learn is that when it comes to human nature, not one of us, not one, is ever completely a saint or a sinner but a combination of both. One of my all-time favorite theologians, Mr. Rogers, <laughs> who was actually a pastor, you know, minister, he once said, have you ever noticed that the very same people who are bad sometimes are the very same people who are good sometimes? It, it reminds me of an old familiar story. It's called Two Wolves. And you, you may be familiar with this story. But it, it goes like this. An old Cherokee once told his grandson about a fight that was going on inside of him. He said it was between two wolves. One was evil, anger, envy, Greed, arrogance, self-pity, gossip, resentment, and false pride. The other wolf was good. Joy, peace, love, hope, humility, kindness, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. And the grandson thought about it for a moment, and then he asked his grandfather, which wolf do you think will win? And the old Cherokee replied, the one that I feed the most. Scripture reminds us that we are born of the flesh and of the spirit. We are created, each one of us, in the image of God. Yet we bear the mark of original sin. As such, there lies within each one of us the capacity for evil and the potential for good. The Apostle Paul said this about himself, about struggling with sin. He says in Romans 7, he says, So the trouble is not with the lost, not with the word of God, or the Torah, or whatever they had back then, the Pentateuch. For it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. 
So I am not the one doing the wrong. It is the sin living in me that does it. And then in verse 18, he says, and I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sin nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And he says, I have discovered this principle of life. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. And this power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. And Paul goes on to say, he says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And then he ends it by saying, thank God that the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is. He says, in my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sin nature, I am a slave to sin. I think this is why the prophet Isaiah was looking for a way to describe the final reconciliation of the world to God. And he put it this way. In Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9, he says, The wolf will live with the lamb. And the leopard will lie down with the young goat. And the calf, the young lion, and the fattened calf together. And a little child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young ones will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play near a cobra's hole, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. In our world, I think that's what's missing, is the knowledge of Yahweh. Not only the knowledge, all of us have head knowledge of that. It's the heart knowledge that trips us up. That little distance between here and here makes all the difference in how you perceive and live life. God's promise to us in Scripture is that the tensions that exist within us, within all of God's creation, will finally be resolved and put to rest. And we shall live in total peace with God and each other forevermore. But until then, they coexist. The wheat and the weeds. They grow side by side. They even grow within us. So much so that to root out the one would be to, to destroy the other. That's the second lesson. The third lesson is that ultimately there will come a day of judgment. Again, in the words of the parable, let both grow together until the harvest. And in the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, first gather up the darnel weeds and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. You see, at harvest time, two things would happen. The wheat and the darnel would be cut, taken to the threshing floor, 
where the grain would be separated from the stalks and the wheat would be plump and golden brown. But the darnel would be small and black. And the women and the children would then separate one from the other, grain by grain. Throwing out the darnel and, of course, keeping the wheat to make flour. And more than once, Jesus told his followers of an impending day of judgment. And he warned them, in the meantime, to watch out for false prophets. He said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. The question is, how do you know one from the other? And Jesus said this. He said, by their fruits, you will know them. That's why I use my favorite saying all the time. You walk walks and you talk talks, but you walk talks louder than you talk talks. Let me share with you this story. It's the story of a, a lesser man. His name was Reverend John Perkins. And according to Philip Yancey in his book, Soul Survivor, John Perkins, a black minister in the South, lived through the worst nightmares of the civil rights movement. Perkins started a church, then a Bible institute, a radio program followed by a health clinic, a co-op, a vocational training center, a recreational center for youth, tutoring programs after school, as well as a housing program. But when he started a voter registration campaign and led an economic boycott to protest police brutality, in downtown Mendenhall, Mississippi, he crossed the line. He was accosted by over a dozen white policemen and beaten so severely that doctors had to remove two-thirds of his stomach. And it took him 18 months to recover. Perkins is quoted as saying, that time was without a doubt my deepest crisis of faith. It was time for me to decide if I really did believe what I had so often professed. That only in the love of Christ, not in the power of violence, is there any hope for me or this world. He said, I began to see how hate could destroy me. And in the end, he said, I had to agree with Dr. King that God wanted us to return good for evil. Love your enemy, Jesus said. And he said, and I determined at that moment to do it. He said, it's a profound and mysterious truth. Jesus' concept of love overpowering hate. I may not see it in my lifetime, but I know it's true. He said, because, I know it's true because on that bed full of bruises and stitches, God made it true to me. He said, I got a transfusion of hope. I couldn't give up. We were just getting underway in Mendenhall. And many years later, Perkins found himself back in Mississippi where he spearheaded a movement for racial reconciliation. And he offered, often appeared with a man named Thomas Terrence. Terrence was a KKK operative who served time for murder but he got converted in prison. And now he pastored a multiracial church in Washington, D.C.
The good news, gang, is that God's grace is seen in the fact that as we grow in the knowledge of God's love and slowly but surely humble ourselves before God and seek His will for our lives, we increasingly reflect His image in which we were created. And our human sinfulness, though it never, ever completely goes away, Teddy, it becomes fainter and fainter by comparison to the light of God's grace and his love. And here's the bottom line. There will always be Darnell among the wheat. A little sinfulness in our souls. But thanks be to God, the harvest will be plentiful. And we shall scrumptiously feast on the bread of life. And by the way, those stalks that the wheat and, and the darnel grew on, once they were threshed and the grain was separated from the stalk, the stalks were bundled together and they were burned as fuel for cooking and for heating. And the Darnell seed that was so poisonous, the Greeks and the Romans found that even though it was poisonous, in small doses it had a medicinal quality as a sedative, as an anesthetic, and an antioxidant. There's nothing that God cannot use. He created it all. He owns it all. So here's the truth. In God's sight, in his sight, nothing and no one is useless. Nothing is lost in his economy. In God's hands, even the dastardly deed of a, a vengeful neighbor can serve a useful purpose. And Romans 8.28 reminds us of this. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. I really pray that we will always remember these lessons. And more importantly, I pray that we'll apply them not only to this ministry, but to our lives. It'll make more of a difference than you could ever imagine. And I want you to think about that as I, I sing this song. It's a song I wrote years ago. But I believe it's important and pertinent for us today. There's a family down the street with nowhere to turn.
come the day to stand before the Lord to hear him say well done good and faithful servant looking back to now we made it through somehow but in our hearts we knew it was worth it it was worth it all we've been called to live for such a time as this to take the love of Jesus to the world around us we've been called to give all we had to give to make a sacrifice that we might live for such a time as this Pray such a time as this to take the love of Jesus to the world around us. We've been called to give all we have to give to make a sacrifice that we might live that we might Father, it is so true. You have placed us in this world, in this generation, in this era of our nation and the world for just such a time as this. And so, Father, I pray again that we will add these lessons to our, our hearts and our lives and especially to this ministry to get the word out that all are welcome. There's no one that has refused a seat at the table of Christ. We love you, Lord. I pray that you would draw us all closer to a deeper walk with you. And that we would offer that same grace and that same love and mercy that you have so freely given to us to every single individual, to every single situation that we face in our life and times. See, the world don't need us. The world needs you. And we have to be the conduit that makes it happen. The bridge instead of the wall. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. God bless you.